Hi friend, Niklas here. Welcome to another episode of the Your Audio Solutions podcast, where it's my job to find the tools and methods from the people that inspire you, so you can apply their knowledge to your own life and work. And today on the show, we have music composer Tiawan Li, and I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Sorry if not, Tiawan. Uh, but he's a music composer. He's, he's doing music for uh, video games and advertisement. And his music is just damn incredible. Uh, I actually found him on LinkedIn first, where he is uh, the top voice of 2020, which we delve into in the podcast and how he got to be there. I think he's actually the only composer in the world, maybe, who has that title on LinkedIn. So... We talk a lot more about that in, in the interview. Um, but yeah, he's a video game composer, music composer. He does incredible music and he posts them on, on LinkedIn, like if short um, clips, which are funny. Uh, but they're very simple clips, actually, which, which um, makes it... It's not funny, haha, it's more like... Uh, he, he, the videos are very simple. It's just he plays his music from Logic uh, with his phone, but it's very animated. He moves his phone according to the music a bit. And yeah, as I said, the music is incredible. So please do go. Please go. <laughs> please go check his music out on LinkedIn. It's incredible. Uh, it was a real pleasure having him on the show. And we talked a lot about um, how to use social media, uh, business, how to negotiate uh, your rate if you're getting hired for a project. A lot about music theory, which actually went over my head. <laughs> Uh, but some very valuable stuff. And if you're an artist, if you're a composer, if you're in the music business at all and you want to get some business tips, how to negotiate and all that sort of stuff, how to, how to play the social media game, I guess you can call it, uh, you, you, you will get a lot out of this interview with Xiao Li. Uh, so I do hope you enjoy it. Also, before we get into the interview, uh, I'd like to tell you about the Audio Tribe. And there's a link to this in the description below to send your name and email address so you have joined the Audio Tribe email list. And by joining the email list for free, obviously, uh, you get exclusive access to interviews before the public. You get a chance to ask uh, up-and-coming guest questions uh, and a lot more stuff I like to do in the future as we grow. Also, feel free to uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel or Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you are listening to this show or watching this show. It's growing slowly but steadily, and that's all thanks to you, so I really appreciate your support. Um, but that's it. Let's get into the interview with Xiaon Li, so please enjoy. Uh, first of all, tell me how to pronounce your name so I do that correctly. Xiao An. Xiao An. That's good. That's actually exactly right. Xiao An. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That's important, man. I, I don't want to mispronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I have, a, I have a friend whose a name is uh, H-J-E-R-T-B-E-R-G, -E and I could never <laughs> say it right. <laughs> yeah, but it's something like that. It's not, it's, uh, he introduces himself sometimes as Hjertberg, but it's obviously that's not how it's said. Wow, where's so, he from? I think he's, uh, he's Swedish. Oh, yeah? That's yeah, the, yeah. The, just like me. Oh, really? Yeah, he's, he's from, um, <clears throat> oh my God, I, I'm, now I'm just blanking. There is uh, Stockholm, and then there's like one, there's like another big city. Gothenburg? Gothenburg, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah. Okay, he's he's from there. And tell, the, tell me his name like, again. Yeah. How do you how do you spell uh, his name? Uh, H J E R T B E R G. Still a weird name, I guess. I think I need to see it. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah, it's, it's it's pretty funny. I I had to spell it out. I had to write write it out phonetically so I would remember how to say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice man. Are you are you in Sweden right now? Uh, no, London. Uh, London. Okay. Been living here for. Seven years, yeah. maybe? Crazy. Oh, so you'd be the first to get the vaccine then. Yeah, there were some people yesterday, you know. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the second guy who got it, his name was... It's William Shakespeare. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I heard, I heard about that. I heard about that. It's crazy, it's man. Funny. But yeah, it's, it's good yeah. to get that all, or, or get the whole process started. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Right. But so how's, I mean, talking about the pandemic, how's life? Because you're in Singapore now, right? Is that correct? I'm in, I'm in Singapore. Um, pretty much things are normal. 
Yeah. Uh, apart from the fact that you have to check, uh, you so in Singapore we have a very rigorous system of contact tracing. Hmm. So when you go to a place, uh, you check in everywhere. Uh, every single room in a mall has a QR code, and so you uh, you you use your phone to scan that QR code with uh, with an app, and that um, lets the government know basically where every individual has been. Um, it's it's very very tight sort of like contact tracing, mm. so they can tell you if if for example there was an outbreak and you were there during the the time of that, uh, they will be able to to find you and then put you in quarantine. Wow, if necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's mm-hmm. good. I mean, that's something because a lot of Asian countries have done really well. You know, also is it South Korea yeah. done really well? Um, yeah, and some other countries, like Taiwan, I think. Yeah, I think it helps to have a culture that's that's centered around following orders and rules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, um, um, a lot of the time, you know, especially for a creative person, that isn't always the best environment. But mm. I'm pretty thankful that um, people are following rules. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> it was Singapore set up because I know I think Taiwan had experience from the first um, SARS virus mm-hmm. from China, yeah. so they knew yep. what to do. Basically, is it the same yeah, for Singapore? Ta- or? Yeah, we everyone. I I think everyone in the every country in the region was were expected this to happen at some point hmm. uh, because we'd seen more than one of these, and uh, you know there was there was significant impact on populations around the area. I think the difference in some of the Western countries is that I think there is a level of sort of um, I, I I'm trying to find a good word for it because conceit sounds really negative. But I suppose conceit that it would never reach um, so far, right? And <clears throat> and because of that, and also because of a lot of uh, values like, um, um, you know, valuing personal freedoms over the community safety and stuff like that, um, that it's very difficult to suddenly put in place restrictions. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's a big part. I mean, in addition to having some really annoying people in leadership, <laughs> right, right, right. right. <laughs> Thank God that's over, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I've been listening to your music on on uh, LinkedIn. I mean, it's yeah. Every time I listen to music, man, it just makes me happy. Or, you know, it always makes me. Damn, <laughs> this is this is so good. Uh, it's great. Thank you. Thank but you. random question first. Every time yeah. I, I see your videos on LinkedIn, uh, do, yeah. do you? Is it just one piano roll? Because every time I see this, like oh. Oh, right. I just didn't expect it to be done that way. Yeah. So in order for Logic to play the piano roll that way smoothly, mm. uh, I I have to, I, I sort of create a new version of the project where I take out all the virtual instruments, all the plugins and everything. All that's left is MIDI data. Right. right? And then I, I, I uh, go through the MIDI data and I remove sort of muted regions because they're not necessary. You know, sometimes you'll see some grayed out that I forgot to take out or whatever. But And then I push everything together so that it kind of visually makes sense. You can see where there's a, an attack or something like that. And then I I play the thing uh, along with a recording, uh, a ro- along with the master that I put in there. And then I, I use my phone and I go like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so it's it's pretty it's pretty simple, and then afterwards I I sync up the the phone audio with the actual right. audio, and so that kind of gives me a sync. But sometimes I have to push it a little bit if if my hands are lazy. I need to make the video um, a little bit uh, rush a little bit. Right. Yeah. I mean, your music is killer, man. Really, oh, really thank you. Good. So how how did you get started? Because did you study at Berkeley in in New York? Uh, uh, uh so. I did study at Berkeley, and uh, and I lived in uh, Boston for about ten years, hmm. right? So, uh, and it's, uh, I started. I, I went there as a guitarist, hmm. uh, aiming to eventually be a session guitarist. Right. And I went there, and I had a rude awakening that not only, not only was I, I not only did I not have, see the commitment in myself to to develop all the way to that level. I mean, I've become a like an okay guitarist. I can play on my recordings. I, I mean, I you can't really put me in a situation where everything is new and I just have to make it up as I go because that takes a lot of experience, right? And it's over the last 10 years, uh, six, seven years, I haven't really played life much. So that's no longer a thing. Mm-hmm. So when I went to Berkeley, I studied jazz composition. 
because it was the closest thing um, that I could study that would teach, give me a rigorous background in theory because um, I, I didn't have a solid grounding in, so say, classical theory. So the composition program was out for me. So I picked jazz because I felt that it was the thing that I could pick up the fastest and develop the most skills in. Mm. And then I realized that I didn't want to be a jazz composer because, again, you know, there's not much money in it. Right. Um, there is there is money in the skills, and I'll get I'll get to that right. But um, there is no not much money in just being a composer for art. So um, towards the end, I started picking up the use of a door. Right, I had been using a door. I had been using Logic to record myself playing and practicing and stuff like that. But I hadn't really used it to produce music. So I did that in my in uh, towards the end of my third year and my fourth year, right. And then I kind of just leaped into music for whoever the hell would pay me right. that's it that, so i when people say music for media the stage and concert they mean please pay me anything right. <laughs> yeah so that's what that's what i was doing so i mean a lot of it was pretty much just trying to figure out a way to make money with music right. uh, i nev- i didn't have i never had a dream of being a Composer. I think the only real dream that there was maybe was kind of being a performer. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's, even now, I, am, I, I don't even think I'm that interested in that. So right. um, and one of the things I did after I graduated was I started an orchestra that I ran for about five years. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was supposed to be a recording orchestra, and I naively thought that you know it would be competitive in some way. But uh, even though I managed to do a fair amount of business and uh, you know, the players that played with me, you know, they had some supplemental income from the gigs and stuff like that. Uh, eventually, my composing revenue started taking over. Uh, I, sorry, profit, not revenue. Because the revenue right. from the orchestra was high, but a lot of it was paid out to the musicians, right? right, right. So um, my com- composing profit started to come in a little bit better, and I, and I moved on to focus on that in uh, 2019 mm. uh, when I closed uh, East Coast Scoring, which was the name of my, my orchestra. Right. So that's where you find me today. Um, everything that you see of me online is just me trying to find work. Right. Yeah. Uh, any chance you had uh, Toma Fujita as a teacher at Berkeley? No, no. Ah. But I did, I did like, uh, I did watch a lot of his videos. And I do have, um, I, funk was probably one of the most, uh, the genres that I practiced the most. Including, you know, that stupid thirty-second note um, rake yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, shit yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. No, you should never use at a gig. Right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, it was. I, I, I did, I did um, learn from some of his videos. Right. Yeah, because I had, I had him on the show a few months ago. Uh, so just oh, funny, really? Yeah. yeah, funny coincidence. That... Say it again. Yeah, he's a great player. Yeah, definitely, man. Yeah. But you said, you know, trying to figure out how to make money in music, something along those lines. And I think that's just, that puts it perfectly as to how many people are try, are, are trying to do, you know, every, everything's about trying to make money, uh, to make a living, obviously. So how, how did you, how did you figure out how to make money in music? Because I guess it is, didn't happen, right? <laughs> I'll let I'll let you know. <laughs> well, I mean, look, look. So I mean, every year is a little bit better, right? This mm-hmm. is some of it. Some of making money with music is sort of a cumulative thing where it gets better every year, and some of the things are leaps. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you meet people, and the thing is, for example, if you're a fresh graduate out of school, right? You are never unless you're like a sheer genius, right? And there are very few of those. And very few of those also have the social skills to do the professional work, right? If you are a genius with the social skills and the connections, then yeah, straight out of school, you could probably like skyrocket, right? But if you have only one of those things, and generally most of us only have one of those things, uh, you will need someone to sort of pull you along uh, a little bit. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have that person. So um, I think the next best thing for a lot of composers and what's worked for me is just being as visible as possible. Because if people don't know you, they won't hire you. Hmm. So I, I try to keep myself as visible as possible because it's the best way to have people know about you without you going up to them and saying, do you need a composer? Can I write for you? Can I work for you? Right? That's a big turnoff. 
Mm. You know, it's much better if you put yourself out there and people come to you. Definitely. I mean, is that how you, because I saw, I saw you are the LinkedIn top voices, which is, that's pretty yeah. cool. I never see that before, but that's, mm-hmm. that's got to be a perfect way, you know, of putting yourself out there. So how did you build, oh. how did you build up that reputation on LinkedIn? What, did you have a strategy? Mm-hmm. Okay, so at, at the root, uh, I think, of every social media strategy, no matter what platform it is, you have to be useful, right, in some way, or really entertaining. And if you can do both things, you have a great sort of uh, combination, right? So no matter what you do, uh, I guess with TikTok, it's more important to be funny than useful because generally, you know, people don't go there to be educated. But the difference with LinkedIn is that it prioritizes insight, Hmm. Right. So uh, if you are if you have something unique to say, something that people might relate to um, personal stories, lessons learned and stuff like that, uh, it will it will help to sort of get engagement up Um, with LinkedIn, as with all other social platforms. Right. You need to figure out what the platform values. Right. And you need to figure out what your connections value and you need to be adding to those all the time because. Um, when someone sees your post and they like your post, their connections will see it. Mm. And that's how you get second degree reach, right? And um, the, so, in, in a, so the two things, right, is the being useful or entertaining or both and being extremely consistent. So I've got about like close to a million um, impressions this year on LinkedIn. Uh, and I've posted probably 500 times something like that, 500 or more, right? And the thing is, posting more isn't necessarily the, the way to go about it. It's better to post once a week that ha- with great engagement than posting useless shit seven times a week, mm. <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you... you so, for I, I mean, uh, your, your question was, like, sort of how did I start building that, right? Mm. Um, so, if... Uh, oh, sorry, a third thing. Mm-hmm. A third thing that might be helpful is to be very community focused. So if you help people, if you're nice to people, you introduce people to each other, um, you will create a lot of value for your network. So you be useful, entertaining, uh, you be consistent, and you be community minded or helpful to others. Right. Mm-hmm. That's awesome, man. And can you transfer that to other platforms? I mean, I guess you obviously you can, right? You can. Uh, I would say that on, for example, Facebook and Instagram, it's a little bit difficult to build a new following right now. Right. It might have been a different story a few years ago, hmm. but I think, and this is probably going to happen with LinkedIn, is that at some point they will have enough users right. that love the platform that they that that they don't need to start, you know, to to elevate the lesser voices mm. but mm. i i don't know maybe they will continue to do that right um did, uh, you, did you try instagram and facebook for example or i was very active on facebook for a while with zero results i will say that facebook is very ex- is excellent at developing an echo chamber in right. that you are surrounded with a lot of people that are like you that uh like the same things you like etc et right mm. linkedin i think helps you to avoid that because people are there for business and when people are involved in business all money is green right so they they are a little bit more tolerant mm. uh, of other views and um you know of course there's like fighting and stuff like that but it's less so than facebook twitter uh, instagram is inherently visual Right, I have some followers, like less than three thousand, right, and that's by no means at any level that is useful for me or a business that might want to work with me. Right. But um, it's 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 sort of like I, I'm not really super sure about Instagram. You have to post also every day, hmm. and like, what am I going to post? My face? Like, this is gonna like people are gonna unfollow me, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> seven days a week. Yeah, so. I, I don't have a I don't have a nice booty. Can't post that. I don't right. have a nice car. Right. Right. Can't post that. Right. No one should. So I, I can't post that. So <laughs> Makes yeah, sense. I'm at a loss for Instagram. I, I'll just be honest with you. Like mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Um, I think a lot of content creators um, that find um, followings on Instagram are also similarly useful or entertaining. Mm. 
Um, but I, I think because Instagram and Facebook uh, make a lot of money from advertising, mm-hmm. um, they, they will they will sort of be very stingy with with views for accounts that do not use advertising, like so that that use organic reach. Right. Whereas on LinkedIn, I think on personal profiles, it's much easier to get organic reach. That's interesting, actually. Um, I haven't thought about that, but it makes sense because your LinkedIn. I mean, I guess they have ads, but they have their premium, uh, whatever it's called, the, the premium profile thing. That, yeah, that's going to yeah. be a, a big revenue for them, right? So they don't have to do maybe what Instagram and Facebook does, or am I wrong? Uh, probably. I mean, probably that helps. I, 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 I'm not super clued in to the mm. sort of the, the back, background, right? right? right but right, right. that makes sense. It makes sense that if a lot of people are using the premium account, then yeah, you know, mm. it, it would, um, they would generate revenue that will allow them to sort of be a little bit more generous uh, to their users. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. and then the more users they get on and who feel like they're being engaged will spend more time and see more ads. And so, mm, exactly, man. Uh, there was something yeah. I saw on your LinkedIn profile. I'm just going to find a quote. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, it ties into what we spoke about here. We said social media. Uh, it's a great yeah. amplifier of success. The That's more it. present you are yeah. and the better you tailor your brand, the more successful you seem. Yeah. And I'm yeah. very intrigued by the the more successful you seem quote. Uh, yeah. Because isn't that, isn't that also what's so misleading by social media in a way that, mm-hmm. you know, like like you said, with, the, with yes. the car, like, oh, if you post yeah. with a car, it means you're rich. But if you look behind the, yeah. the curtain, right. <laughs> it's just rent right. a car, you know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so... Definitely, I, I think that even even if you didn't resort to those tricks, mm. if you were always on, and you're always presentable, and you're all, and you're always doing something, and your work is always there, and it's always visible, and you have something interesting to say, people will start to assume that you are successful just because they see you a lot, mm. right? I mean, of course, sort of doing sort of the, doing the tricks of having the car and and all this kind of nonsense, like people believe it. Right. Okay. Maybe I shouldn't say nonsense. It's just a legitimate marketing tactic. Whatever. Mm. Right. It's just I don't feel like I I want to use it myself. Nor can I because I don't have a nice car. So. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, which is why I you know I'm ju- so judgmental of these people. <laughs> That's but, all right. But, but yeah, you it, yeah you the more visible you are, the more successful you seem. One of the one of the great um what, what was the the word for it? Uh, let me see. Not injustice. The the one of the great mistakes, right? I think of this decade or the the last few decades was giving Donald Trump so much TV airtime. Right. It's a massive mistake because, of course, millions of people believe he is a competent businessman when uh, when the numbers simply show that he is not. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. So in a way, you can use it. You can use the dark arts, but for good. Mm. <laughs> you know. Makes sense, man. I mean, so. Yeah. How how has that uh, had a positive in, impact on your business, so to speak? I mean, mm-hmm. do you? I don't know because when I look at your profile, I don't think I don't really know what I think. I don't. It's not like oh, this is this guy. Yeah, you seem successful when I look at your profile. Because um, but you, I don't I mean, see anything that's bullshit, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, also because you make yeah. kick-ass music. I think that that also helps. So it, it's not about being successful looking successful is more this guy makes kick-ass music and people seem to to love it i think that's that's really helped you yeah. or you must have yeah it it, it has mm. i i will be honest that really the the things that give me the most visibility are not is not the music right. it's the text it's the insight and stuff mm-hmm. like that the music is important because that's i mean i'm a composer right i mean exactly. that, that's that's my job i don't get paid to say things I get paid to write music, mm-hmm. um, and and uh, so the the it's a mix, right? And um, it's the the looking successful part, right? I mean, like the more engagement, of course, the better, right? Mm-hmm. Because it seems like oh, people believe him, mm-hmm. and then that's kind of like uh, it snowballs, I guess, exactly. right? But it's impossible to get to that point unless you say something that connects with people, right? I mean, you can always do like the the easy thing and say something negative. And that gets you a lot of engagement. But in the long run, if you're just a negative person, you get a lot of engagement online. But pretty much not people are not going to reach out to you. And in my case, um, some people who are 
surprising in surprising positions in surprising companies hmm. have um, reached out to me as a result of my posts right. right and a lot of people watch in the background you know there uh, one of my a client right was circling me for a year because I knew he was circling me for a year because I see him view my profile every couple of months or something like that. A year later, a gig came in, but he never liked any of my posts or commented on any of them. Yeah. So there are a lot of people who don't even view your profile, but they're lurking and they're aware of you. Mm. You know? So Yeah, that, that's interesting. I mean, because, yeah. so, you know, in, in, in your success on LinkedIn, has, you, has that led to a lot of work? I mean, you said uh, this particular guy, but has it been, has it, has it attracted a lot of clients to you? It's, it's led to some. So uh, some of this was based on old connections, but LinkedIn helps to keep them fresh. Mm -hmm. For example, um, I gave a workshop at Facebook uh, because right. a guy who I, who I worked with directly in 2016 was working at a game company in Germany, right? And then he went over to work in um, Facebook. And then I told him that I was back in Singapore, right? Because he, he traveled from Germany to Singapore to work in this office. Mm -hmm. And so we caught up. And then he said, oh, you know, it'd be nice for me to do a workshop sometime. Uh, we, he held a workshop. There were like maybe th uh, four or five people there, right? Mm -hmm. This was an online workshop. I did it from Ireland where I was stuck during the pandemic. Oh, yeah? And, uh, Shit. Yeah. And so I met these people that were at the workshop. Mm -hmm. I was just giving a workshop about uh, music and games and sort of how much it would cost, what the process is like, that sort of thing, you know, just educational. Mm -hmm. And I connected with them. And eventually one of them brought me a client. Yeah, so you never know how this, this shit is going to happen. Uh, something else is, yeah, so then that one guy who was circling me for a year, that led to one of the best paying gigs of my life. Right. Uh, and um, some of the others, I think they're just kind of irons in the fire. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. And just try to keep them as warm as possible. But And, and who knows if anything will come in. Mm -hmm. But what I do know is that for the last year or so, I have pretty much not sent out any outbound um, messages trying to get work. Right, because I've, I'm trying to rely increasingly on a purely inbound strategy. Uh, inbound meaning that you know people would um, mm -hmm. look at my content, find it interesting, click through to my profile, and get in touch with me. That's interesting. I mean, how how does that that work in more detail? Mm -hmm. the, the inbound strategy yeah. is that something you can just yeah. start relying on? Because I guess it's it would be quite empty if you just say I'm just going to rely on inbound. <laughs> well, so inbound, how do you get it going? Inbound. Well, it's content, right? Right. So if you reach out to the world, the world will reach back. Right. So if you, if you make content all the time, and by the way, it's like extremely tiring and time consuming, and you have to be very consistent about it. And some days, you know, like some days I'm approaching 8.30 p.m. where some, a lot of my posts will <clears throat> go out at 8.30 p.m. Hmm. because I want to catch people before they start work right. uh, in America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I catch people in Europe right at lunch or like uh, right after lunch right and i catch people here after work so like this it's it's one of those things that that's one of the times the times that i like to post because it tends to get me the most engagement um and sometimes it's approaching 8 30 a.m i don't have a post and i'm like fuck what am i supposed to do right i'm i, I don't feel like writing mm. <laughs> so, but you just have to do it yeah exactly yeah. i mean so how long or maybe that's not the right question i guess because it doesn't really matter how long it takes but how is, how important is it to play the long game in 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 this endeavor of building the inbound uh, strategy and just having content pay off? It's all the long game. Mm. It's it's all the long game because so that there are two. So I'm not a marketer, and uh, you know marketers who are listening to this may may be able to fill in some of the blanks or maybe correct me, but. There are two kinds of marketing that are at play here, right? There's the brand marketing, which is the long-term strategy, and then there's demand marketing, which is, um, you know, you have a little call to action, like come to the store or whatever, or buy this, 50% off this, you know, that kind of shit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what I'm doing is mostly brand marketing, personal brand, right? Mm -hmm. And um, that what that does, because it gives me the appearance of, greater success, um, it is more likely that the people who come to me uh, will not lowball me. Or if they do lowball me, I can shoot back a giant number at them and they're not going to be like, 
you should have accepted the offer, you ungrateful asshole, right? It's just, it, it just makes sense. Oh, yeah, it makes sense you would charge that much. Mm-hmm. You know, and that, that, so by doing that, you get to increase sort of like the, the, the little bracket of your price mm. uh, because pe- people assume that just that's, and also it's how you carry yourself when you ask for something and right. you know how to negotiate, but that's a whole different thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so the inbound, the, the long term thing, Right, the brand strategy, the 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 brand marketing is extremely important for you to sort of be more desirable as a product, as a service. Yeah, so that's that's really important. And um, I would say that maybe the equivalent in personal branding of like the, the demand side or like starting conversations with people, getting those leads, is to uh, post content that makes people think, that makes people have conversations, and when you connect with people. You must always, every single connection that I, every single, almost every single new connection that I have, right, I send a message to, Hmm. right? And it will never have anything to do with work. Hmm. Never, never. That's like, I I make sure that it's not work. And um, so eventually, if you have like a million, like literally, uh, if you have a million connections, right, someone in that connection network is going to need your services probably, right? Mm-hmm. Especially if you curated that million to be in the right industry, mm-hmm. right? And and if, let's say, 1% of them needed your services, right? That's 10,000 people that need your services. You could not possibly fulfill all of that. So now you have really high demand for your skills and then that you can drive the price up because mm-hmm. of economics, mm-hmm. right? Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that, that's going very, to play here. Yeah. yeah, it's super interesting. And yeah. h- how do you? Because this is something I struggle with, like the long, the playing the long game. Because yeah. Yeah. I think when I started out, the long game for me was, oh, if it doesn't, if nothing happens in the let's say six months, that means is is wrong. You know, do something wrong. But yeah. I'm starting to realizing that might not be the case. It can be. There's no set rule. That's what that's what I'm trying to to oh, yeah. realize. This. I don't know why I had that set time frame in my head. I don't know where that came from, but I'm starting to realize there's no such set time frame. It just takes the yeah. amount of time yes. it takes. Yeah, but there shouldn't be a set rule, right? Yeah, um, there, there isn't really a set rule. Mm. There is, in, in general, I think, a principle of like, if, if you're having very sort of uh, unproductive and perhaps even like sort of not really friendly communication of a person, Mm. then just, you could just leave it, right? Because um, talking to them further might just irritate them more or or whatever, right? So um, this is why content creation is great because when they open up their timeline, unless they've unfollowed you, right? Which can happen. But if if you're not posting annoying stuff all the time or your work all the time, they won't unfollow you, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And if, if those people who you're not really talking to see your your stuff um it's less invasive than mm. a personal conversation uh there was this potential client it was, it was a pretty big company right uh, that asked me for a bid uh, a few years ago and i gave them a bid and they said that's like three times the next bid right. um which by the way my bid wasn't that high it wasn't that high. I think it was quite reasonable, but it's just that this, this company might have been used to paying very low rates. Mm. The same person that I talked to two years later or, or two or three years later uh, f- saw my posts on LinkedIn, started liking my posts on LinkedIn, reached out and wanted to start the conversation again. Yeah, right. but that went dead. That went dead. But the fact that that person reached out, right? No, I, I didn't, I didn't um, get in touch with him. You know, so the fact that that person reached out, I think, is a pretty good uh, testimonial for con- being consistent with your content and being visible. Definitely, that's very interesting. But how how do you do it in terms of pricing? Like you, you mentioned it throughout. How? Yeah. yeah w- what's your thoughts on on valuing yourself and and mm-hmm. not maybe charging by the hour, mm-hmm. but charging by the value right. you bring in? What's your thoughts yeah. on, on on that? Okay, so it's it's a common, I think it's a, okay, maybe not a misconception, but I, I think we need to sort of reframe uh, the way, the language that we use. So it's it's like, it's not your value. It's, it's not, it's not the value that you bring. 
It is what is the value of this project succeeding to the client? Right. And how much are they willing to pay? Mm. And that that is sort of what drives the price. And it has nothing to do with your value inherently as an artist, right? And which is why hourly is not a really a good uh, a good way to charge, especially for composing, because like then you just screw yourself if you're like me. I mean, like I've written like three minutes of uh, a minute of orchestral music in three hours, like when I was really trying like killing myself doing it fast, right? I don't do it that fast anymore <laughs> because it's just not worth it. Mm. Um, but when, even when I when I was doing that, if I was being paid per hour, I would have been paid more if I took longer. Yeah, so exactly. it either motivates me to be dishonest and and say I work more hours than I did, or just take longer, right? So that's an hourly rate is not really a good way for a musician to charge. Hmm. Exactly. I mean, that, that's what um, yeah. took me some, yeah. some time to learn myself, and uh, I see a lot of people asking me the same thing, like how they earn more money. But it's exactly what you're saying. If you focus on the value, the what, what do you say? Say that again. Was the value of succeeding uh, the, for the client? Uh, the yeah yeah what yeah actually that that's right so uh, what like what is the value of the project right or the mm. success of the project mm. right and how much are they willing to pay you out of that mm -hmm. you know in order to so it depends on depending on your your role right I mean that may be difficult to like connect so for example if you're running an advertising campaign it's easier to connect the dollars and cents because you know how many sa extra sales whatever right. Uh, and with us, it's less quantifiable. Mm. So um, how you persuade them is just <laughs> that uh, that that has more to do with your your brand, right. right? If they believe that the brand is yeah, there's very little that you can say logically to convince someone of your value uh, of of your value to them mm. if your branding is not up to the scratch. Right. But what are some of the questions you ask a potential um, employer? Uh, to to find out what the value will be of their mm -hmm. project succeeding. Right. So, uh, for example, I think in advertising, I, I tend to ask, like, you know, what countries it's going to be aired in, and then, you know, you know what the population of those countries are, you know what the product is, you know what the size of the company, you know, maybe if you can kind of get an idea of sort of what, what the what they're hoping to gain from all this, mm. right? You can kind of get a general idea like of the different brackets to charge, mm. right? Um, so, but in games, that's a little bit harder because there seems to be for some reason uh, standard rates, which is really annoying uh, because they haven't changed in years, right? <laughs> There's always a thousand dollar rate that's thrown, a thousand US, US dollar rate that's being thrown around as normal, but it's not. What's, it was what's normal. That? What's that covering but, then? Is that per day or? Uh, a minute of music. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that is like sort of like what used to be known as the triple A mm. rate, mm. right? But it's not. Mm. It's not. So uh, to my knowledge, to my knowledge, rates can range from $100, don't do those gigs, to like uh, 3000 plus. Per, per minute of music. Per, per minute. Per right. minute, yes. But don't, don't forget, this is all finished music, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's, if it's, if it's at best... An ex, uh, um, exclusive perpetual license, mm -hmm. if not a buyout. So it is still very cheap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. well, that's very interesting. Um, so, is there any other questions you ask to find out? Let's say a game company reaches out. Is there anything? Yeah. You, I mean, you, you talked about the the standard fee, but is there anything else you have done to be able to find out more yeah. and therefore uh, bring the the price up? Yeah, well, so I mean, if it's an indie company that has some moderate success, you know, I, by the way, I've never written for an indie game, so right. this is purely hypothetical. Mm. Um, if it was an indie game company and they had some moderate success, but obviously, you know, it's like they sold 20,000 copies, 30,000 copies, you are probably not go going to be able to charge a couple thousand. Right. Yeah, but if you're working with a company that you can find out, it's sometimes. If you do a little bit of research, you can find out when companies talk about their revenue and their profit because they're trying to attract investors. Right. So some sometimes the information is out there. And so if you find out that the company is pulling in millions and millions of dollars a month, then uh, pretty much whatever you charge is going to be like a drop in the pond uh, for them. Mm. Yeah. But there are some companies that make millions and millions of dollars and they still uh, want you to do it for very cheap, in which case you, you, you can just say no, right? <laughs> 
Yeah. You know, but yeah. So, but if, if don't just say no, come at them with a big number. And the more of us do that, right, right, right. Uh, the more they'll be like, hmm, maybe we are the assholes. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But would yeah. you ever take a gig uh, for a big company if it, if it was early in your career and, it, and it just a good um, thing to put on your CV? Would you, would you take it? I consider myself an early career composer. Right? Right, right, I've been right. in industry for like I've been I've been in industry for like say seven um, seven years, mm-hmm. right? I, I I still consider myself early career because I think it wasn't until 2016 that I actually wrote for like a proper like game, mm. yeah. So um, it before that it was like tiny projects and stuff like that. So it's um, would I would you should you take a gig with a big company? For less because it will give you the name. Mm. Yes, if you feel that it is useful to you, and if you feel like they're not going to drop you, you don't get the sense they're going to drop you halfway, right? But don't expect them to be loyal or increase your rate. That is, um, that is not their responsibility. Mm. I mean, here am I talking to a Scandinavian? I feel like um, I feel like you know most people in. Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, and Finland would probably say that yes, it is the employer's responsibility. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and and I, I think so too. I actually lean towards that personal belief myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but they won't. I I do not believe that they will do it out of uh, moral right. uh, uh, out of out of moral obligation. Yeah. Mm. Right. So so in order to increase your price you need to make use of that opportunity to boost your brand as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And then let's say they do a sequel and then everyone is clamoring for the same composer. Right. And then they'll, they'll say how much you want to charge this time. And like, well, let's talk. Mm -hmm. And then you have the opportunity to renegotiate. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do that, which as a lot of composers do, they just like go into the work and then the company drops them for a bigger name composer. Right. Right. It's it's really not the company's fault because their their job as an organism is to maximize profit. So you need to help them mm-hmm. as a composer by also by being an artist yourself. Mm-hmm. That's very difficult for me because I see I I really don't see myself as an artist. But I feel like the LinkedIn stuff is kind of giving me a little bit of a middle road, <laughs> where I am known <laughs> for the thing that I do, but not necessarily as an artist. Right. That's it's, yeah. it's super interesting. This this topics of value and charging and business so if a company came to you and wanted to negotiate renegotiate let's say on a new project how would you prepare to to make it as successful as possible like the outcome as successful as possible for for both of you i guess oh okay so this is like a negotiation question right so you have to so the the term that's used um in 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 like Formal negotiation school, I suppose. I never went, but I, I, I read a lot of books. The the term is BATNA. It's best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Right. Right. So if you figure out what sort of like your floor is and that you that you won't go below that, that gives you a foundation. Right. Otherwise they'll just bargain you into zero. Right. And um, there are a lot of different tactics that are out there. I would suggest reading books. Like um, there was one that a good friend Sebastian Wolf recommended to me. Uh it's called negotiating with giants. Mm-hmm. It's negotiating when you don't really have a position of power. And then there is also Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Mm-hmm. He is an ex-FBI negotiator and is a very good book about negotiation and specific tactics. Yes. But the, the best thing to do to go in is, uh, when, when you go in, is to be as informed as possible. <clears throat> and that means you have to be informed about your value as well. So if it's like a, it's a sequel and as a renegotiation, you have to know sort of how well they did hmm. versus how well they thought they were going to do. And that's something you would know because you had a conversation about that before, right? Hmm. And then um, you need to know sort of like if people like the music, right? Are there ways for you to prove this, right? I mean, so <clears throat> it, it's, it's important to get creative about it before the project is over, Right. Um, to see if there's some way that you can measure this. Right. And uh, going in also maybe, yeah, you need to know like where you stand with the company. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, if you had a really good experience working with them and they're and the, the more they like you, the less they'll be likely to try and screw with you. Because right. people people work with who they like. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, this is this is not a very organized piece of advice. <laughs> That's all right, man. I to mean, be, yeah, to be honest, every 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 situation is different. But I would recommend those two books. Mm-hmm. They're yeah. very good. Yeah. Thanks for those recommendations. Um, is there any other books you would recommend in in terms of business and and entrepreneurship? Uh, well, I mean, there's one classic one that a lot of entrepreneurs read. It's called Zero to One. It's by Peter Thiel. It's mm-hmm. uh, he's one of the original founders of PayPal. Right, or investors, right. In PayPal, right? And uh, he's talking about what zero to one is like. You know, startups they they make something where that previously there was nothing, right? So that's the premise of the book. And he's talking about um, how to sort of <clears throat> know whether something is going to work, how to get your product to the consumers, and and, and things like that. Uh, another one that's um, two other books that I'll recommend. Um, they're not really about business, business. They're more about human psychology. Uh, so one of them is called Influence by Robert Cialdini. He's a social psychology professor at the University of Arizona mm-hmm. and a uh, very brilliant guy. And uh, it, it talks about sort of subconscious ways to influence others and to also know, knowing these tactics, how to avoid being influenced yourself. Right. Yeah. And uh, another book is um, How to, make, uh, how oh, to yeah. Win Friends and Influence People. That one is really good. I've read that one. Really, yeah, really yeah. good. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's yeah, a book yeah. I can really recommend to people to check out too. Yeah. Yeah. So these books are good. You know, um, Negotiating with Giants, Never Split the Difference, Influenced by Robert Cialdini, uh, Zero to One by Peter Thiel, um, and How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. And uh, one more, it's a little bit heavy reading. Um, it's called Blue Ocean Strategy. I've heard about that, but I never, I never investigated it at all. Yeah, the the basic premise is that um, it, it's it's sort of like a philosophy of innovation in order to break into new spaces that others are not. Hmm. So, for example, composers are not on LinkedIn, and the ones that are on LinkedIn don't know how to use it. Hmm. They still don't, right? And I've seen people copying my videos, and um, I get that. Imitation is the best, sincerest form of flattery, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, I, I don't know what it says about you as a as a as a creative person right. if you copy someone's work, mm, right? Yeah. I nothing very good. Um, <clears throat> so people don't know how to use it. So going in there was sort of like a great way for me to experiment and and learn in an in a less competitive environment and sort of solidify a position. And I think like I've done that now in that I'm probably the most vocal and visible composer for media on or one of the most right Hmm. in on linkedin probably in the world Hmm. just because they're not many it's not it's not like it's not like i'm super fucking visible it's just that there's not very many others out there and the reason i got the top voices thing is because singapore is small Right. right. It's not it's not huge. It's less than six million people. And even though it is a great honor to be on that list under the prime minister of all people, <laughs> right, yeah. uh, it, it it was only possible because right. it's it's a relatively small uh, population of users. Hmm. Yeah. That, that's 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 so smart because that's what you gotta do to find those undiscovered yeah. places like like you're talking about. I can't take credit. I can't take credit for it. It wasn't. It, right. it wasn't like I planned to come here so that I would get that. You know, it's right. just and and I didn't even plan to come here because it was smaller, right? That's that's not that's not it. It just was right. the next part of my life, and uh, it just happened to be that way. And coming onto LinkedIn, um, and using it, I knew a little bit that it was not very well used. But I, the main reason I went on was because I, I knew that decision makers from companies that I wanted to work with would be there and that would be the best place to be visible. Mm. But I didn't go there knowing that everyone was so bad at using right, it. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know? And the, the the videos, like the this this like uh, stuff right with that nobody does, right? Mm-hmm. Was really an accident because previously I was just I was just, you know, taking videos of the screen and then I was like sometimes zooming in on the beat. And then after a while, I got bored and I just like zoom in on every every beat. And uh, I just I did it because I thought it was funny. I mean, I was probably just doing it to to make my uh, wife laugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, some of my best some of my best ideas come out that way. <laughs> but yeah, so it was an accident. And then I've I've sort of like kept doing that since. Hmm. 
I think it's getting old. I think I'll, I'll probably need to figure out a way to sort of make it fresh again. But right. yeah, it's, it's served me well for a year. Right. I mean, yeah, I think it's brilliant, man. I and mean, it seems like a, I don't want to say a happy accident, but in a way it was like that, I guess. I mean, you, yeah, you, 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 you found the, on, you know, a uh, new territory, even though it was not planned, maybe, but that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everything is, I mean, a lot of successes are accidents and then how you turn them into sort of like value for yourself, right? Then, then you, you sort of have to look at it and be like, okay, what worked? Mm -hmm. What, what did it mean? Right. Because the music itself, I mean, it's, it's good. It's mm -hmm. not like world class. It's not like Grammy winning music. It's not, it's just fun. It's entertaining. Right. right. right? And then, and then, uh, the, but, and good quality, you know, like I am not like super happy of all my mixes, but right. it's fine. People play this on their phone. Right? Mm -hmm. Who gives a shit? Right? So, <laughs> so I um, and when I do that, and with the low res video and and all the blur, the blurring shit, right? It it looks like I don't take my works too seriously. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's true. Even though it's good, mm -hmm. and also the zooming in and stuff like that, it shows humor. So like uh, I think I accidentally stumbled onto a formula that showed several characteristics of myself mm -hmm. in the best light in a very compact medium that also showcased my work. Mm -hmm. So that was an accident. Yeah, but a, a, an yeah. awesome accident. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Awesome, man. I mean, it's, it's really cool. And it's, yeah, it's interesting to hearing the, 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 the story behind it and stuff. So yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah, um, yeah my pleasure. I, I love to talk to you about, there was a post that was really interesting on your profile, again, going back to your LinkedIn uh, mm -hmm. world. Yeah. Uh, but it had to do with... Um, I don't remember the post exactly, but it was about you know the the, the notion that everyone has twelve nodes, but then you delve okay. you delve deeper into into it where you said, well everyone has twelve nodes, but if you think about the the, the subsequent nodes, then it gets interesting, because yeah. then that's when you get all the different Mathematical unlimited variations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Could, could you? So, I mean, talk about yeah. more about that. Sorry. Well, yeah, I mean, um, with a very, so um, one, one thing I would recommend that uh, everyone watch just to be humbled, mm -hmm. right, for their own laziness, right, is to watch Adam Neely, the bass player, practice over a major skill for five hours. Right. Okay, and I think that sort of, that was sort of the seed of this, and uh, I, I realized that, you know, like, we're, obsessed about learning scales we're obsessed about learning all this kind of shit but like we how r really how well do we understand the basics you know and i'm all and and the thing is in a lot of the music that i write and i like literally almost everything is in c just because of the 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 client right, right. so i'm restricted to that one key right? right but you can i i've written like pretty much a, a different thing every single time Right, borrowing from different cultural influences, borrowing from uh, using different tempos, different keys. Uh, no, not different keys. Um, different. Um, it's not quite different keys, but different like tonal and modal centers. Right, and right, right. and so you, you just and different instrumentation. Right, mode, time signature, whatever. Right, metric modulations are fine because it doesn't interfere with the key as long as it's not distracting, and uh, so. You don't need a lot to make really weird shit. You you don't, right? Um, the first person who had the idea to sign their name on a toilet seat, I can't remember his the name of this artist. I think he was French guy, right? And then it, it went into a museum or something like that. And you know everyone was outraged because how can that be art? Because but you didn't think of that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? It was his idea, right? Mm -hmm. So you, I I think I think that we we have unlimited possibilities to create and I think we should maybe we should be a little more focused on the basics and less on trying to be clever mm -hmm. because I mean there's a reason the major scale connects so well with a lot of people right because there's something inherently natural in its in its conception right so you can do a lot of things within that and th there's still probably more possibilities than you could comprehend as a, a human being so you know I mean when when I was writing there I just kind of realized that every time I every time I make a decision to do something, right, it comes from. It's like. This is this is what AI is going to have a difficult time doing. Right. Is that you know it's like, 
I think someone had this. I, I read an article about AI at some point and, you know, um, robots. And, like, if, if you drive down the road, you can focus on, on like, a cat that you saw on, in the fence, like, to the right for a split second while also being aware that there is um, someone that might be crossing the road. You don't know. They seem unsure. <laughs> Right. Okay. And then you're making a million decisions at once. So I mean, we do that in regular life, but in music, especially so. Right. Every single note that you write is a decision made with a finite number of choices. But with every new choice, right, the uniqueness of your composition is sort of compounded. And I didn't really, I didn't really have sort of like an end end point for this. It's just more like, just think about how complicated the thing you're doing is mm, mm, mm. You know, and how pretty pretty much it would be impossible for anyone to do the do it the way that you do yeah. this is why i don't i don't have a problem with sharing theoretical secrets or orchestration secrets you know because it's not a secret it's done right. it's been done a million times before already just whether you choose to do it in one combination is up to you exactly i mean i find it very interesting because it's always been the notion oh, everyone has the same 12 notes but I found when you wrote that, it made it, it made it make more sense in terms of oh, that's why people can write different music. I mean, yeah, everyone has this, has the twelve twelve same twelve notes, yeah. but we're not everyone. Not everyone is making the same decisions around those twelve notes, like like you said. Yeah, um, yeah. Which which is why I find it remarkable that so many composers sound the same. Right, that's interesting. You can't do that unless you are trying right so everyone is trying to go toward this imaginary ideal sound which is nonsense mm -hmm. it's fucking nonsense just do just do do something new mm -hmm. right i mean you don't have to write the exact same song but you can write like you know like um uh, everyone's written country music everyone's written rap i mean okay not everyone's written rap you know that a lot of people that write rap a lot of people write country music but lil nas x put that together mm -hmm. right in a way that nobody really thought of but he didn't do really anything new you just combined right things to old things in a new way mm. right and I, I feel like in a smaller and less artistic way that's what i did when i wrote vampire disco <laughs> that's an awesome track man <laughs> yeah thank you yeah, yeah so it's just it's, it's it's that there are there are so many things you can do to be unique and you don't even have to try you so stop trying to be someone else mm -hmm. you know yeah it's very fascinating and I'd love to ask you, because you mentioned, you know, practicing the major scale as an example. Yeah. And yeah. I, I heard many, many people saying this, like, let's, uh, Tomo said it when I interviewed him, uh, us, Nori, the, the jazz yes. guitarist, the same. And I, I, like, I know the fact that it's very good to practice um, these kind of things, like triads, whatnot. But I don't think I, don't think I fully understand what the benefit is. Can you explain that if you, if you know it? Okay, sure. So, I mean, uh, if you think about uh, a, a chord with full extensions, like a C major 13 with a sharp 11, right? right? So, um, they are made up of triads. Mm. It's just that triads that are stacked on top of each other. So, if you know how to play, uh, if you have a very good command of triads, right, you would be able to uh, cycle maybe a C triad and an E minor triad or what, whatever, or an A and an A minor triad, right? in different inversions, up mm -hmm. and down, and you would play a solo that people would be like, holy shit, like that's just literally the major scale, right? right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, this is, I mean, this is a sort of like a very basic way of, of, of explaining it, but you know, um, and for example, you know, if you are able, if your conception of triads is, is complete, right, which mine isn't, right? I mean, only theoretically, I wouldn't be able to do this, but for example, if you were playing a, a G7, right? Like someone was, uh, a bass player was playing the root and p a piano player, left hand was playing the, the B and the um, F, right? Maybe with like a, a, an E, right? A 13, right? Just a very basic um, dominant seven chord. You could play uh, an E triad over that because they'll give you the flat nine and give you the natural 13 extension, right? And if you played E triad and if you, and, or you, and you found maybe a couple of other triads, Right to play over that, uh, you would have a very interesting sort of uh, approach. Right. You can play an E, 
yeah, you could play an uh, E triad. You could play a B flat minor triad. Right. Right. Because the B flat has is B flat. It's got the sharp nine. Right. It's got the F. Right. That's the seven. Right. And it's got the C sharp. Mm. Right. So you get so with the E and the B flat triads, which are a tritone apart. Mm-hmm. Right in in their root, right? It, it will give you like very interesting possibilities. In addition to sort of just knowing that you can use those two triads, you can approach every single note of those triads as a chord tone using either um, yeah, oh, man, I I can't remember the name, the official names of these approaches. You can approach it from below. You can approach it from above. Right. You can approach it by surrounding it. I can't remember what that's called. Right. Uh, yeah. So you know, instead of playing a B, you play a C B flat B. You know, mm-hmm. that, that gives you sort of like that very jazzy approach sound. Uh, and then instead of just doing that, maybe like you could think of it in terms of a horn section. So instead of playing just C and uh, B flat and and uh, B, uh, let's see, let's let's say you want, you could do a parallel approach. So uh, if you ended up on the B and that was an E triad with the B on the top, right, you could harmonize this in triads and either do that with uh, with the parallel voicing of just using that constant structure E, or you could reharmonize it and on the the B flat you play a different approach chord or something. Right. You know, so there are a lot of different ways that you can <laughs> use the concept of tri- right. It's like fucking insane, right? It's just it just it just goes <laughs> off into the universe and oh, yeah. like just, and and literally like there is no end to sort of the creativity that you can express, and right. not all of it has to be sort of in this kind of extended harmony jazzy weird way mm. uh, there is a there is a video by a pianist named Russell Ferrante from the Yellow Jackets mm. that I uh, enjoy uh, very much where he shows how you can stack uh, the four um, like the four and the five uh, you can stack triads together in a certain kind of voicing in order to get really sort of pretty sounding voicings and that's right. sort of one principle it's all triads like I I, I think I don't know when it hit me, you know, that, like, and also triads have a very sort of like strong structure that we're used to hearing. Mm. So if you orchestrate it and you had a very strong bass, mm. right, and you harmonize the melody in nonsense triads, just use whatever fuck triad you want, right, it would sound fine. This is something that I learned that uh, some gospel uh, organ players would do, right, you know, you have the third and seventh in your, uh, in your left hand, right, and you have maybe your foot playing a bass line, right, and then you you are just dropping triad voicings down from the top, right? And you would already and you know these gospel organists they know exactly what triad to use, right? If like they're playing on the G seven and they're playing a chromatic line, right? Uh, or they they have an E on the top and you play a G sharp B E, right? And then maybe your next note is a, a D. So what what do you play, right? Maybe you can play a D minor, right? A D and then an F and then an A. Right. So and that would give you a different a different thing. But now it's full. Right, and it's a very strong sound, so we accept it. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, also, a, a lot of this went yeah. over my head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry, but, but okay. this is all. It, it's like literally all um, triads. Right. Right. So, I mean, you 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 understand? Uh, did you understand the the, the earlier thing about but, uh, yeah, the G7? So if I understand yeah. it correctly, I'm going to bring it back to super basic. Uh, yeah. Not including sevens or anything like that. Let's say you just have a a C major chord. Yeah. I mean, so C, yeah. C, E, G, I guess. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. That's correct. Does knowing, does it mean that I can then play any chord triad in that scale over that triad? Is that, uh, is that, that what it means? You, no one is stopping you right. is, the, is the correct answer. Okay. No one is stopping you. Does it sound good? It may, it may not. It depends on your control of dissonance and your control of the relationship of the notes that you have hmm. to the note, to the chord that is being played. Right. So if you play a D flat, you play a D flat note, right? It's a very dissonant interval. It's known as a flat nine or minor second, right? And so if you're able to control that dissonance and resolve it somehow, right, or make it less dissonant, right? Hmm. If you play a D flat note by itself on a C, on a C bass, mm-hmm. right? That's a little dissonant. But if you play the D flat triad. So D flat, uh, A flat, F, right? D flat on the top. Uh, it becomes less dissonant because there is this consonant structure right. that is sort of reinforced, uh, supporting that top note. So 
triads are fucking amazing. Right. <laughs> you can do literal. You can do pretty much anything. Our our music theory, right? The chords that you use, right, are based just in triads. And mm-hmm. when you add tensions onto them, like you add the seven, you add the nine, mm-hmm. right, and you add uh, the eleventh, right, for on the C, like C E G, and then you extend that chord. You you're adding thirds on top of that. That's why it's called tertian harmony, right? It's, it's harmony that's based on thirds. Right. So now when you've mastered thirds, then you can move on to fourths. And it's called quartal harmony. And that's a right. whole other can of worms. <laughs> okay. And the quintal harmony, which is different, right? So there's like there there is a there is a lot of crazy shit that doesn't doesn't leave it's not too far from the basics. Right. But can make it real weird. <laughs> I mean, this is all the mind blowing to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, it is a little, it is a little advanced, and I think that um, sort of really get, you know, if if you if you learn your major scales, mm-hmm. right, and you learn to play them in thirds, you learn to play them in fourths, right, you know, C E D F E G, you know, like uh, instead of just playing up and down the scale, mm-hmm. that's a different way of knowing the scale. Can right? you say and that then, again? So knowing. So, the- Knowing the scale, right? Mm-hmm. You don't just play do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Sometimes you play do, mi, re, fa, uh, mi, so, right? right? And then da, 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 right? And, and that's a different way of knowing the scale. And instead of going do, mi, right? Maybe you can do, do, fa, mm. right? Do, fa, re, so, my solfege is shit. So I'm not going to keep going. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So if, if you do that, then how many ways do you know how to play the major scale? Right. And if the answer is two or three, <laughs> you don't know it. And, yeah, but does, does that mean that when you say that, does that mean uh, how well you know how well you know how to play different notes in in a sequence? No. No, it, it's like how do you understand how to use the major scale, and do you understand all the ways that it can be used? Right. right, and it's a it's a mind thing. It's not the finger thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The finger thing is part of it, right? In that you you need to mechanistically be able to play the thing, mm-hmm. right? But if but if you can't conceive of it in your mind and in your ear, you won't be able to get a musical result. So you have to understand exactly. sort of like why does it sound the way it sounds? Yeah. yeah, you know, and that's actually very interesting because when I started out playing guitar, um, I, I I I think I did it the wrong way because. And that's something I tried to uh, learn now. The last few years is actually focusing more on the ear rather than the technical part, because that's what I did starting out. I only mm-hmm. learned scales mechanically, you know. Yeah. And I think I don't know if it's a common thing, but I think it was a mistake. Um, mm. Because it goes I don't think back. It's a mistake. To... Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's a mistake to know your scales. It's just that now you have to get to know them in a different way. Exactly. So. I think that's more important. Because then you learn it the way you, you were explaining it now, which is the way to make music in the end. Because you don't want to make music from knowing a scale mechanically and just and just yeah right. You know it's what I mean? Not really music. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's yeah. I mean, this this goes over my head, but it's super interesting. So yeah, thanks for yeah. explaining it. A big pleasure having you on, man. Maybe maybe before we just wrap up, where can people find yeah. more stuff about you? And actually, last question: the music you, yeah. you post on. On LinkedIn and stuff. Is there? Do you have like a? Do you have a Spotify profile? Is there anything we can listen to music so properly? A lot of a lot of the music that I post online, I have an understanding of my client where you know I'm. I'm. It's fine for me to post the stuff, but mm-hmm. uh, they haven't released the music yet. If if it ever happens, you know, you'll you'll see it on LinkedIn. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but it's 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 not anywhere. But if you wanted to. Um, let me see if I can find a link to my Spotify. I have like two smooth jazz songs on Spotify. Ah, oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's it. I don't know if you've heard it already, but um, I think it, must have it was that. on my web. Yeah, it's on my website. There are like two videos there, but right. I'll send you my artist page. Mhm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I put the link below so people can click it. Sure. Yeah, and 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 uh, my LinkedIn, my Instagram is Chinese dot potato. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and my website is xiaoanli.com. Right. Yeah, I'll just put it there. Thank you, man. I, yeah, I'll put links to that below so people can check yeah. it out. But thank you, man. I really appreciate you sharing all the valuable knowledge about business, about music. It was a real pleasure talking to you, man. 
Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. And you know, like, if 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 uh, feel free to cut it if like I go on too long. Just no, 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 it's all fine, man. Yeah. yeah. All fine. Okay. Cool. All awesome, right. man. Thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure talking to you, and I hope you, the listener, enjoyed it as well. Again, check out Xiang Li's uh, LinkedIn profile, his um, music, his website, uh, Instagram, and all that. Links uh, all below. Also, feel free to join the Audio Tribe email list. It's free, of course. To send your name and email address using the link below. Um, and by joining, you get exclusive access to interviews before the public, chance um, to ask um, up-and-coming guests questions, and a lot more stuff I like to do in the future. Also, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you are listening or watching this show. Uh, we're growing slowly but steadily, and all thanks to you. And I really appreciate your support. But that's it for this week. A pleasure having you here as always. Uh, I will see you next week. So take care.